for uh, having me, ever, uh, everyone. I'm uh, in a steam company, obviously, and um, speaking as, a, as an ambulance driver or a paramedic here, it's, um, it's a, a pleasure to be here. So I'll just sound very new to our profession, and uh, I just want to take you through how we've gone about why and how we've gone about introducing I'll just sound into uh, our practice. Um, but it, it's always good to chuck these, uh, these Twitter and Instagram posts up there and it makes you feel a little bit uh, unethical about your practice uh, when you see these blanket statements made and um, I guess we, we see these things and, and they, that whole foam, foam ed world is quite interesting and, uh, and it drives a lot of discussion in our place about how, how much we should or shouldn't do this and are we unethical practitioners if we're not doing it. Um, our service is a bit different to a lot of other worldwide services, so I'm, sp I'm speaking specifically about our helicopter service, which is a, a paramedic led service um, in Victoria. It's a statewide annual service, fully funded by the state. We're not, we're not a fundraising arm or anything like uh, many uh, interstate services are, are fully supported by the Victorian taxpayer. There's four and a half thousand paramedics in Australia who are all undergraduate degree trained. And uh, of those, we have a, a group called Mobile Intensive Care Ambulance, who go on to do a postgraduate diploma at Monash University. And there's about 500 of those. The flight paramedic population do another graduate certificate after all of that in about 10 years or so uh, before they, they hit that level. Um, uh, there's only 42 of us. And so for the ultrasound stuff, there's only 42 of us statewide actually practicing that skill at this time. And so a small group, we've got a, a high skill set, but we've got a very high exposure to critically unwell patients. And they define the vast majority of our workload um, and, and when you send in expensive ambulances like a, a $22 million helicopter somewhere, uh, you tend to select your patients. Um, so we're a small group, we're, we're all postgraduate ed educated a number of times by the time we get to this point, uh, and the average experience of, of EMS for each paramedic is 22 years, obviously, with a couple of standard deviations. So very experienced stuff, we've seen a lot of sick people. Uh, we have a very robust clinical governance system, uh, each one of our cases, no matter how acute or not, is audited at at least three levels, um, and that includes pre anesthesia and, and, um, and ultrasound, uh, right, to, right through even if it was a, a broken ankle on a, on a hill or something. Uh, and we have five helicopters statewide in, in Victoria. We have one base, uh, sorry, two based here at Essendon, one at La Trobe Valley where I work, Bendigo to the north, and one to the west at uh, Warrnambool, and Essendon also has, has five planes respond on as well, but they mainly do a bit more of the routine transport around the state. Ultrasound is an interesting thing and we coined this term and, and paramedics are a special bunch uh, and I've coined this term pants or paramedic acute new toy syndrome. <laughs> so uh, paramedics are very keen when it comes to something that's tangible to use it. So engaging people in actually using the device is not difficult because they like playing with stuff. Um, it, it's, it's obviously the science behind it that's the hard part. But the engagement uh, when we introduced ultrasound into our service in the uh, start of 2016 uh, was, was quite high. People are interested in, and, to, and can see uh, potential benefits. The history of our service has actually been going on for a long time. We've had to have uh, kind of <coughs> repeated pushes to introduce the technology um, into our service. And in 2007, uh, some doctors from the Alfred Hospital here, one of our two major trauma centres, uh, started looking at introducing a, a trial of a small group of paramedics uh, using the device that was available at the time, which wasn't much good. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of great portable devices around at the time. All of the paramedics got trained, but there was a, a fallover with some funding. Uh, the device was unreliable, poor image quality, and it didn't really progress. It kind of fell over. However, we started uh, carrying four units of O-negative uh, packed red cells or red cell concentrators, the blood bank boxes to call it, uh, in 2011. And that kind of changed the way we started doing things. A lot of questions about should we give blood for people who are hypotensive, who are trauma patients, should we give fluid first? And that, that argument happens in every emergency department or ambulance service around the world to this day. But what, what were we going to use to guide how we use this precious resource? Uh, we are very uh, stringent on how we look after our blood. I think in the in what's that now six years that we've carried uh, blood, we've lost eight units in that time on a, a rotation policy that we use. We're very uh, protective of that asset and, and that, you know, very, at this time, useful patient intervention. We re-looked at it ultrasound in 2012. We've got to come up with some money. We've got to find out how we're going to train the paramedics. 
we're going to find out whether it has any clinical utility in our service. So it was a bit of a long push. But then in 2015, um, Steve Fanon, who's our, our medical director, went to SMAC, asked the emergency physicians there, who does ultrasound, who does finger thoracostomy, who does uh, DSI for, for uh, you know, modified RSI. They all put their hands up, came back, and he rolled it out that week when he got back. So that was enough for him, and we uh, commenced eFast only uh, at that time in 2016. And we've kind of it rolled that out further now as uh, using ultrasound as part of our formal traumatic cardiac arrest guideline and, and not doing any closed chest compressions as our first point of care with traumatic arrest in the field, which is an amazing change of practice for paramedics to say don't do CPR on that person in cardiac arrest. Um, Myself and Toby here, one of my colleagues, uh, and a few of uh, the rest of us from Monash and Andrews Victoria published a scoping review uh, last year, looking at how paramedics are educated in ultrasound around the world. And that essentially varied from two minutes through to two weeks, depending on which service uh, was, was, bringing, or was bringing ultrasound in. And still, nobody really knows how, how do you teach somebody who's got limited exposure to these patients. It doesn't matter how many people bash their car into a pole, there's only so many of them around the, around the state of communications, uh, ultrasound for trauma. Uh, how do we maintain, or how do we gain competence, competency? Uh, how do we maintain it? How can people be proficient with a mobile workforce, although it's small? Uh, so we looked at, at these, uh, these different um, services around the world, and there's a huge uh, variance in the way that paramedics are educated. And the kind of big take-home messages were um, that there was no consistent curriculum, uh, as there is for other professional groups. There was no uh, correlation with whether the ultrasound that they actually were, were doing had any, any correlation with clinical utility. We, we're changing patient outcomes. What, what's your, your use? Um, and there's no real great prospective studies correlating the, the education process with patient outcome. Um, and so it was an interesting exercise. Unfortunately, that piece of work came after we educated our paramedics. <laughs> so uh, we, we kind of had these devices land on our doorstep. So uh, Steve went out, he found some money, the devices landed, and we got, okay, we're gonna train these guys. And so uh, some emergency physicians from the Alfred Hospital delivered a four hour face-to-face -face, uh, didactic session, which essentially involved probably one third of the <coughs> classroom uh, we skipped over the physics. We, when you when you teach paramedics, they generally will, generally will follow instruction quite well and follow procedure quite well. So it was simply about learning a bit of a basic about the physics. But let's get out there. Let's revise the anatomy. Let's find out what we need to find. Um, after that, we headed off to UTS, which is how our relationship with UTS began, uh, to take each of the paramedic educators, of which one per base exists, and have those paramedics become. Uh, champions, if you like, by doing a more advanced bit of training and taking that knowledge back uh, to the group. Um, Toby and myself and a few others then went out after doing the UTS uh, courses and uh, gaining a bit of patient exposure uh, by going out and making some videos for the population, breaking down in kind of you know small TED talk chunks on each uh, individual assessment, and then with uh, Anthony, uh, who's a specialist uh, cardiac sonographer. Uh, we made, which, which we found, and, and obviously has been spoken about it today, the echo is the hardest thing for us. The rest of it seems okay, uh, but we had Anthony to uh, deliver a comprehensive session on how to get the best view, especially when we transitioned into our cardiac arrest guideline on essentially determining ongoing resuscitation based on that um, subcycle view and, and whether or not we've got PDA versus pseudo PDA. Um, and just this last uh, six to seven months, when we were able to get the linear pro, um, which we just started off with the phase pro initially for the first pro, for most of the first year, uh, we went out uh, back to UTS a couple of paramedics per base to do the vascular course and the vascular diet. We started off uh, with this device. This is the first one we used back in 2007, and as I said, it was the single transducer. That was all we had to work with, and the technology obviously has evolved quite a bit. At Monash, we teach the undergraduate very briefly, but also at, uh, from an awareness point of view, we teach into the second year undergraduate paramedic students what ultrasound can be used for. We don't teach them uh, to proficiency or, or any other um, 
intention of them using it in the field, but if, if nothing else, it's a great anatomy lesson and revision for the undergrads. We bring it back into the postgraduate intensive care paramedics who are at six to seven years into their career by that stage. Again, from an awareness point of view, and that they might work with the flight paramedics in the field to actually uh, see and use ultrasound clinically. Um, sorry, and might actually be kind enough to buy uh, three or four V-scans for the undergrad and postgraduate students to use. So uh, even though they're not implementing the skill clinically, they're able to kind of wave them over a patient and, uh, oh sorry, wave them over each other and, uh, and get a, an idea of how the technology works in the hope that that will become part of their practice down the track. When we first started at Air Ambulance, we started off with uh, the Nanomax, which was not a great pre-hospital device because its, uh, its use in high ambient light environments was, was ordinary, it was an invisible image, essentially. And uh, the one we settled on eventually was the obvious, which is what we use now, uh, with the uh, two transducers that are currently available. And the linear uh, transducer has changed the way we've done lung ultrasound in particular because it's, uh, the, the phase was was not great for the, the, the novice practitioner. It was quite hard to, uh, to teach and also to interpret the imaging. But the linear uh, transducer has, as again, it's been spoken about today, has changed the way we assess the human borax in We did a uh, retrospective analysis of our first year, and the data, although it's pretty, pretty raw and, and uh, data, and, and we acknowledge the, uh, the reporting bias that might exist was just to see what the experience was of the paramedics in that first year. Um, and what essentially it translates to is, and, and again we'll correlate a lot of you know, lesser experienced um, sonographers I guess, uh, is that uh, there, there was a lot of ifs, buts and maybes and it was hard for the paramedics to say absolutely 100% I'm happy that that's positive bust. And even that last image uh, that was shown of the uh, of Morrison's pouch with that tiny bit of fluid and that's kind of where we might find ourselves especially in that first hour post injury where there's not this explosion of free fluid for example uh, in Morrison's pouch. So for the first year um, data showed that the, the and when I say guys at this stage until, until Monday we haven't had any um, female microflot paramedics but Tuesday or Monday which is great finally. Uh, but so when I say the guys uh, had about a 73% chance of saying, I'm happy that it's negative. And uh, from there, a couple of ifs, buts and maybes around that 10% like I'm not sure. Then a couple of guys didn't really write uh, what, what they found. But only, uh, only 11% of cases where they happy to say, absolutely 100% there's free fluid. And that's all we're really assessing for. I've, and I've included in those numbers where they've said yes to a pneumothorax and an absence of a lung slide. No, uh, so these are of the positives. No one brought a positive cardiac. And uh, as you can see, right up a quadrant, which will not surprise you, free fluid in Morrison's pouch was where the vast majority of the positives and also in the, uh, the pneumothorax. And, and that's been our big one, is the chest, which I'll talk about in a second, a bit more. Other things we've noted in our first year, we weren't sure about where it came in the assessment. We didn't really discuss with the paramedics, you know, DRA, B, U, C, H, we don't know where to put it. Um, is it in the secondary survey? Is it in the primary survey for paramedics? Are there uh, assessment, you know, you know traditional assessment uh, procedures, tools that are, are being put aside in lieu of ultrasound? Um, we, we're still kind of not really sure where we are with that because we don't want to discourage the paramedics from using the tool as well uh, and especially in patients where uh, uh, the analogy about the counterfeit money before was great we're trying to get the guys to do it in every single patient where they can so they know what normal is to compare with abnormal and you often have an hour and a half flight back with a patient who's not needing any intervention or active uh, care at that time, so we encourage them to do ultrasound in flight on the way back to hospital, just to get an idea. Um, we, we had this ad hoc confirmation of positive, so we don't have the image and have an ability to confirm that with an expert, because we're, we're not experts and we're never gonna get there. We're never gonna see the amount of patients to truly call ourselves truly competent, proficient, and experts at this. Um, so one of the things we've identified, and we should have probably from the outset, is that we need expert confirmation of image interpretation. How do we go about that? 
Uh, we, we have problems with our ECR, so electronic patient care record, and, and the way that the data is populated, it's been a bit hard to study the data because some people write U slash sound, ultrasound, eFast, IVIS, you know, all these different uh, data entry points, but we're, we're on the way to fixing that one. Um, is it relevant to the receiving major trauma centre? Do they care? They go, yeah, thanks, mate. Positive, fast, sure. I'll see you when you get it. Hang up. And, um, and, and we, we don't know. So at this stage, we're trying to work out how, how to add value to the patient and for the hospital. Um, we've had a lot of guideline changes. We're not sure where we stand with regards to, so we're gonna say, okay, man, bash car, rinse a pole, blood pressure 50, um, got sore guts, positive E fast. So do we not give normal saline and just go straight for, for the blood? Uh, it sounds intuitive, but it's, it's not necessarily uh, the way advisors that we have that have gone at this stage, but we don't know. We've still got a long way to go. A um, couple of examples uh, of where we found it useful. This is a man who tripped over on my night shift on Thursday night and, and elbowed himself in ribs as he fell over and um, became profoundly hypotensive. And this is an in-flight, you can see the lights reflecting off the roof of the, of the helicopter, uh, an in-flight uh, EFAST on the way that I was able to report to the receiving hospital who of course repeated it uh, uh, when, when I got there, but that's fine. Um, but uh, it, it, we have found it for the EFAST sites to be a fairly easy skill to gain, especially, and again, I know that this is an extreme example, um, but we have found it pretty good and we found it useful and we found it for patients like this where you can categorically go, well, this guy's got no blood pressure and I'll get on the phone to the receiving physician and say, just give him some blood, absolutely. Um, uh, I'll hold on this one in a second, but uh, uh, Toby and one of his colleagues were involved in a case, and, and this is probably where we're finding the greatest benefit of ultrasound in our practice, uh, of a young girl recently who, uh, unbeknownst to them, in a, who had polytrauma, she had open book pelvis, uh, spleen and liver lax, uh, traumatic brain injury, eight-year-old down in South Gippsland, and uh, they, they've proceeded to, to give her a pre-hospital RSI, um, at, after which point of positive pressure ventilation, she's deteriorated quite significantly, um, and, and unbeknownst to the guys, she had a ruptured uh, hemi diaphragm, and, and half of her gastric contents were in a thorax. And Toby, as he speaks about the case, the first thing he did was to go to do bilateral chest decompression, uh, which would be the intuitive thing to do, and he went straight to the, uh, eventually went straight to the, the ultrasound when they, the, the two paramedics had kind of so called Everything else doesn't look like pneumothorax. Um, let's confirm it. And then out comes the, the linear program. And sure enough, there's lung slide. They don't decompress. But both lungs are up and uh, they manage otherwise. We fly frequently over uh, the Alpine National Park, especially where I work at the Track Valley. We respond over to the ski fields, over to Bright, uh, Coriong, up to the border, etc. Um, where historically we would get there, man falling off mountain bike into a tree, chest injury, positive mechanism, a bit of shortness of breath, probably a bit of busted ribs and some guarding and sats at 91 and a half, and you're like, a bit of decreased air entry because he's not breathing deep because of his broken ribs, and the pilot says, oh, there's some funny weather, we're gonna have to come back at 10,000 feet, and if there is a stable pneumothorax in that patient, and we go up to 10,000 feet, uh, then that will potentially become a tension pneumothorax and then you're suddenly looking for needles in the back of the helicopter or, or finger thoracostomy as we would do now. So often we would prophylactically decompress those patients uh, with an intercostal catheter uh, before going just a, uh, an anterior approach and often, based on that clinical assessment, uh, we would be inserting needles into lungs that were up because it was a pulmonary contusion or it was a hemothorax or it was just simply uh, decreased um, tidal volume with broken ribs, and we can eliminate that now simply by uh, chucking the linear probe line and confirming or, or otherwise uh, lung slide, which is a benefit. That's probably where it has shown its greatest value. Um, but probably my you Yahoo moment uh, was uh, in a ditch on the side of Mount Bulbor or the Mount Bulbor tourist road, which is this tiny road that goes up the top of Mount Bulbor. And, a snake coming down over my shoulder and a fern leaf in my face and mosquitoes everywhere and a motorcyclist in a ditch with a, a broken femur and in absolute inability to gain IV access and we're at the, the, 
a lot of pain, we're going to need to put in his leg in a traction splint and a very real prospect of, uh, despite you know, all and sundry having a go at an IV, uh, putting an IO in this guy to give him analgesia, which is a, you know, seems counterintuitive to cause pain to, to deliver analgesia. Um, but I thought I'll, I'll, I'll give it a crack uh, with the linear probe, and sure enough, there was a, a nice, juicy uh, cubital fossil vein and in a, in a dirty ditch with a clean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> aseptic approach, <laughs> slid a, a 16 gauge into his cubital fossa, and, and it was just, I just couldn't believe how easy that really was, and it was just for me taking the step to go, well, I'm going to have to back myself on this, and it wasn't that difficult. And again, thanks to the ETS guys for their, their training in that, it was a, it was a great force. Um, where are we going to head in the future? Um, we, paramedics in Australia are not a registered profession, but they will be as of September 2018. Uh, so we, we would like somehow to formalise the, the ultrasound education for paramedics within that registration construct. Um, and, but we, we really need to find out which of these assessments, which do cost time at a scene, or in transit or whatever, actually correlate with improved outcomes in, in patients. Clearly, I think we can make a case for the chest, um, as, a, as for the abdomen, we don't know yet, will it change uh, the, the treatment? I think it can. You know, you can be suffering a traumatic injury and not necessarily be bleeding and be hypotensive and you may not need blood. Uh, and, and normal certainly might be okay if you've got a positive um, free fluid in the abdomen, well then blood can seem to um, We would like to uh, have our images qualified by experts in real time. Um, but if that's the case, if you get the image at the major trauma centre, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to repeat scan? Or are you going to hold the theatre? That's, that's the big question, we don't know. The nerve block stuff that's been presented today has been fantastic. There's some good data on, on paramedic uh, nerve block um, delivery around the place in Big Trial in New South Wales a couple of years ago um, for femoral nerve block. And so we'll see how we go. This is a study, and this is what I use as a correlation that was done in, at Monash Hospital in 2007. It started where, uh, and it was alluded to earlier, for uh, alerting the cath lab well before by paramedics in the field saying, well, here's the stem. And so my paramedics in Victoria, if, if they had to hang their hat on the thing they're probably best at, it's probably the cardiology side of things. Very uh, proficient at TCG interpretation. But for the system, the greater health system, it wasn't enough to just say that my paramedic has said that it's a STEMI, Therefore, over the cath lab, they wanted us to transmit the image so that the cardiology reg or consultant or whoever could go, yep, stem it open the lab. And that's fair enough for a systems-based approach. So, uh, and, and that has been amazing. But for the first six months of all of that project, every patient had a, an ED nurse and registrar hanging off the patient as you were wheeling around to the cath lab to say, I've got to do a 12 lead and we've got to take a troponin and the rest of it. And it just it got there eventually. But uh, this is where I think we could potentially go with ultrasound. If we can demonstrate proficiency, send the image ahead of time and have the physician, expert, whoever it might be, confirm the image. Um, and the project we really want to work on is that wireless transmission. We can do it with 12 lead ECG. You're sending the same thing. It's just a, a, a diagram, really. And so I think we can achieve that. The, the data, the, the technological capacity exists, it's the motivation to, to get it to happen. And there's some other things going on with ambulances about sending other um, types of clinical information to hospitals in real time and decision support tools that, that will hopefully guide this project. So if we kind of let the technology uh, develop around us, then we'll be able to integrate into it. Thanks very much for your time and have an answer. Ben, have you seen any um, situations or have you had any uh, clinical ones from your mates about very small pneumothoraces that you categorically saw with linear that they weren't contributing to the patient being unstable and so you sat on them and watched them? Yeah, look, it's a hard one because at the same time that we got the linear, linear uh, transducer, <laughs> we started performing finger thoracostomy instead of a needle deep depression. Uh, in, sorry, this is in patients who are positive pressure ventilated, not, not patients who are awake. So we'd still use a needle with an awake person. Um, so I think that I think if this was in the hands of 
a, a more junior practitioner, I think absence of lung slide equals intervention. Whereas I would say, so I guess the answer to your question is small pneumothorax, clinical context, experienced practitioner, absence lung, lung slide but no compromise, I think the guys will sit on their hands. Yeah. It's a quite, and, and you know, if I look at my own practice from day one on the helicopter right through to today, and I went to Malakuta the other day and didn't intubate someone who I would have intubated five years ago. Yeah. And so I think by, get, by having mature practitioners take this type of technology on, I think in that context, I think we'd probably see the, the staff sit on their hands more than they would go to intubate and then intervene if there was deterioration.